Media today are everywhere, online, on air, in the elevator for heaven's sake. They're ubiquitous, but they've also got no shortage of critics, some bashing them for being elitist, others bemoaning the so-called clickbait dumbing down of the news. Here to reflect on whether there's a widening gap between the press and the public, we welcome Sue Ann Kelman, Professor Emeritus of the Ryerson School of Journalism, and Chris Waddell, Professor and Director of the Bachelor of Media Production and Design Program at the School of Journalism and Communication at Carleton University. And it's a delight to have you two familiar faces back in those chairs. Good to have you here tonight. Chris, here is what you wrote around the time the Justin Trudeau blackface scandal broke. You wrote, the media has traditionally played a valuable role in helping its audience sort out the consequential from the inconsequential or the less consequential. The media makes that argument in positioning itself as an essential pillar of democracy. Allowing that to slip away when its economic future is threatened and audiences are already disappearing seems both short-sighted and a self-inflicted marginalization when the media can least afford it. Let's get into this. Give us an example of how the media are sort of forgetting their traditional role of drawing distinctions between what matters a lot and what matters a little. Well, I think we've seen a little bit of that, Stephen, in, in some of the coverage of, of Mr. Trudeau and the brown face, black face incident. What struck me as being most interesting about that was the night that the story actually came out was uh, uh, broke a little bit after dinner in the evening. I watched CBC that night on 10 o'clock. They had some streeters from Vancouver. People stopped in the street. What do you think about this? And what was interesting about the streeters is nobody was outraged. Nobody was, some people were disappointed. Some people were angry. Some people thought it was uh, embarrassing. But they also said, you know, that happened 20 years ago. And they said, and that's, and I've got more important things to think about when I decide who I'm going to vote for. Even people of colour said that. Yes, and, and, uh, and I'll tell you something more about that in a second. But what was most interesting is, having been and worked in the media for a while, I kind of suspected, had they found anyone who was outraged, they would have likely been in that clip package. Mm -hmm. And the fact they couldn't was kind of interesting. And that continued the next day or two. On the Friday, the Globe and Mail ran seven pages on the story. Yes. Seven pages. I, I didn't, haven't bothered to go back and look and see what was the last event that, that well, probably their coverage of SNC-Lavalin was seven <laughs> pages. But, but, but it seemed to be, and, the, and the, the public opinion polling that's been subsequently, and I'll just use David Coletto at Abacus as an example, he found basically uh, about 24% of the people that they surveyed in the three days after were found, their opinion of Mr. Trudeau went down after seeing that. They also found that 66% of that 24% were conservatives. Hmm. So, so it, 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 had a, it seemed to have a negative impact on some liberals, some green supporters and some NDP supporters, but not very many. And, and as we've seen what's happened, um, that's, that seems to be the medium term impression. So, all right, do you want to say something I before I follow up? I just want a quick interjection. Yeah. I would say this is not so new. And the two words I would throw at you are Meech Lake. Mm -hmm. I think you were, you were working in media in 1987. I was working for the Global Mail. Yes, so yes. we had the um, missile attack on the USS Stark. Mm -hmm. We had poor old Gorbachev running around trying to sell perestroika and glasnost to his own people mm -hmm. in the outside world. We had the start of the Intifada, and I, at the Journal at CBC, and I'm sure you at the Globe, mm -hmm. was surrounded by a group that I thought of as the Meech Lake Moonies, going around muttering to themselves if they would just bracket this clause. And every time I met ordinary people, they had no interest in Meech Lake at all. So it's not so new. Well, uh, except I think, I think there's a significant difference. And the significant difference I would suggest is that, that uh, what we seem to have done, cutbacks, layoffs, yeah. reduced size of newsrooms, financial pressures news organizations are under, it strikes me that, that, that to a significant degree, what journalism is doing has changed. So that instead of telling people how to think about an issue, which is providing them with the background and, uh, and examples of where it's happened before, the history, everything else, too much of journalism is now telling people what to think about things. Mm. And without actually giving them, so we immediately jump to Mr. Trudeau and Brownface, and I'm not saying it's not a story, is a scandal, is a bombshell, is everything else. Well, the public doesn't share those sorts well, of things. Well, let me, that's what I wanted to follow up with you, uh, Sue Ann, because the, the, the SNC story, SNC Lavalin scandal, got a ton of coverage. Yes. Blackface, Brownface got a ton of coverage. The polls apparently haven't moved, you know, if this had happened in the States, let's face it, he'd be dead. Yes. It's happened here. The polls have moved, but not all that much. Does that suggest that the amount of coverage the media have put towards these issues has been unwarranted. 
Yes, and I think it, it relates to what Chris just said about how overworked um, and the pressures on people. They keep looking, well, the media, keep looking for stories that will give people a jolt. And they thought this, that these two would be those kinds of stories. Journalists live in a very rarefied world. It's like restaurant critics. I tend not to trust the, the restaurants that restaurant critics love because they eat out all the time. And they develop a fondness for, say, parts of an animal I don't even want to think about, never mind eat. <laughs> Journalists work with other people who are political junkies. It's one of the reasons people become journalists. So their interests are more rarefied than the general public. But would you but say, I think, Chris? But, but yeah, I think there's ahead. something else going on, too. And that's that, that if you go to newsrooms these days, a significant component of many newsrooms is what's called chart beat. It's, it's called chart, what? Chart, chart beat. beat. Chart beat, is, oh. which is a in real time um, display of how many people are reading different stories. And increasingly, um, News organizations respond to that. Um, the stories that actually do very well in Chartbeat tend to be the stories, tend to be not necessarily news stories, but more columns, opinions. The more outrageous, the better, because the more outrageous they are, they then get repeated on social media, and that drives more people to look at it. And before you know it, you're, you're into a little bit of, of that uh, reinforcing thing. Has but, that propelled the coverage of blackface, brownface, do you think? Potentially. I don't know. Um, uh, but, but, but that's being driven by money. Because it's being driven by the fact that news organizations have lost significant advertising revenue. We've talked about you've talked about that in the show before. And so one way they think they can get some of it is by being and and, and here we're emulating the, the worst of the US media at the moment, I'd say. We're 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 trying to um, uh, do things that is basically clickbait. Uh, and and but the problem with that is I think in the process, I don't, I'm just speculating here. I think you're alienating your traditional audience mm -hmm. and the clickbait you're getting is not an audience that's going to pay for your news regularly, mm -hmm. which is what you need because there are people who will drop in in response to a specific uh, social media prompt, will read that story, either send it to their friends and then go off and do something else. Right. So, so it, it's in pursuit of short term money, I'm wondering whether to some degree news organizations aren't in fact creating Long, greater longer term long term problems. disaster what he said yes would you say there are issues that matter regardless of whether there's an audience for them or not yes and then what do we do about that this is a real problem um i've, I've been thinking about this a lot uh, when i started working in the business and for my whole career I started in public broadcasting, like TVO, so it wasn't the same pressure. But even at the privately owned companies, like the Globe and Mail, journalists felt that they were not there just to make money for a corporation, but to tell the public what the public needed to know in the course of learning it themselves, to bring people the issues that were important to them. Then, I don't know, 15 years ago, I was at a journalism educators conference, and while my colleagues went off to the history and teaching seminars, I went to see what Satan was doing in demographics <laughs> and audience <laughs> measurement. Uh -huh. And a station man from, manager from Arizona got up and explained perfectly calmly that their target audience was women 25 to 45, and they had done focus groups, and those women didn't like war coverage and tended to turn to a different station if there were war coverage. So they didn't cover the Iraq war much. You know, in order, women 25 he, to 45 weren't In order to sell detergents, they decided that it wasn't important. Uh -huh. I see that kind of reasoning all over the place, and it contributes to that leveling that you referred mm -hmm. to in the article that Vladimir Putin is treated in exactly the same way as Justin Bieber and the Kardashians. The public really doesn't need to know that much about Justin Bieber and the Kardashians. But they love but to it know would, that. But, but it would be really useful for them mm -hmm. to understand more about Vladimir Putin because that could affect their lives. Mm -hmm. But, but, but I, I, you know, I don't know, Steve, on the, on the they love to know about that. Yes, people click on it, but does that, what does that actually mean and I and and it, to some people it's a rationalization for that's why we do it as opposed to it's you know nobody cares about international news nobody cares about this nobody cares about that so we don't do very much of it well I'm not sure that's true um, it gets I, their I, attention Chris come on it does, it does get their attention yeah. but things get your attention all the time hmm. like a guy honks his car horn when you're crossing the street and that gets your attention but it doesn't change your mind about anything. It doesn't really do anything other than catch your attention for a few minutes. I think, I would say one of the challenges, and we see it in an election campaign at the moment, is we cover elections now like we did in 1970. Yes. Why are we still doing that? Meaning what? We sit on buses with leaders, we travel around the country, we all do the same story. We never really, um, have you heard, it, has any news organization taken 
a, a page or a half page or a minute or two and, and said, here's what this leader is saying today? No, hmm. right? Nobody does that. Um, have, we, have, we gone out to, have we gone out to all candidates' meetings at the local level, not to hear what the candidates say, but to hear what the voters are asking and then say, hmm, those questions the voters were asking were a little... They didn't really understand the issue. Maybe we should do a story explaining what the issue is. Which, ex yeah. which, which is explains why so many of the outlets that I particularly admire were wrong about Donald Trump and his chances of becoming president. Because they are urban people, educated people. They weren't out there finding out what rural voters out think. Out of touch is what you're trying yes, to say. Yes, out of touch would be what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, laid on top of by the fact that they don't have the money or don't want to spend the money to put the journalists in touch. Mm -hmm. And be fair, pe people who are working in the media, as your own staff knows, for a 24-hour news cycle, they're working all the time. They don't have a lot of time to sit and think and strategize. But we seem to be in a time where people only want the news that fits with their particular worldview at the moment, and they are, I don't know about immune, but they are certainly less interested in hearing competing views, right? This is absolutely true. This is the yeah. consumer approach to news, mm -hmm. and it's extremely dangerous, especially since media tends to cater to it. For example, if you are following only Canadian media, how much do you hear about Mexico, 125 million people and are one of our major trading parties? How much do you hear about Nigeria, more than 200 million people? Or even Indonesia, 250 million people? Sure. The Kardashians you can read about, but we are covering the world less and less on the principle that the audience isn't interested. The less they hear about it, the less interested they'll be. It's as if we are training people to turn away from the media. It's not a good economic model. We even don't cover the United States very well. I mean, most of our... Who, who's we? Well, the media in Canada. Legacy media in Canada? Yeah. We cover, we cover Washington, we cover New York, we cover Wall Street. So, um, and Iowa, Hollywood. Wisconsin... And Hollywood, and Hollywood, yes. Mm. So, uh, we don't cover Winnipeg to Chicago. We don't cover um, um, Calgary and Denver, which are the relationship on the energy mm -hmm. industry. So, Donald Trump was a big surprise to us, too, because just like the American media that may be mostly in, in Washington and New York, much of our media is in Toronto and Ottawa, hmm. and those may be comparable cities. But, but I, I, I would, Steve, Steve, say, you're probably right about what you say, about that's what people want, but who is it that's offering you anything else that we can test that theory against? Hmm. Good. Not enough people. <laughs> no, nobody, <laughs> either for financial reasons or for other reasons, maybe it's partly because much of our media is chain-owned by very few organizations. Hmm. Um, who's trying something different? Who's doing something different that's saying, well, let's see if there's an audience well, for that? Well, I think online they're trying a lot of different things, aren't they? Yes. yes. You yes. see that there. Yes. Yeah. But they also tend to be more... The material you see online tends to be more focused around a single issue or, or yes. a few issues, not trying to cover the waterfront of everything. Yeah. For sure. Let's share some numbers here. This is a poll recently done by a group called Historica Canada. And, uh, Sheldon, can we put these numbers up? And I'll read them out loud for those listening on podcast. 69% of survey respondents believed they could tell the difference between fact and opinion, but only 12% got a perfect score when asked to classify six test statements included in the poll. And we're going to give you some examples of that right here. For example, the Montreal Canadiens have won more Stanley Cups than any other team in the NHL. And apparently, only 54% were able to identify that statement as a fact. It's a very unfortunate fact, but we, <laughs> but, but we have to acknowledge that it is an empirically provable fact. I was alive the last time the Leafs won the Stanley Cup. <laughs> Don't admit it. 52 okay. years ago. <laughs> yes. And counting. Here's another one. The Battle of Vimy Ridge was the most important moment in Canadian history. Fact or opinion? Well, only 41% of people surveyed were able to correctly classify that as a statement of opinion. Was Vimy Ridge the most important moment in Canadian history? Well, you can make it an argument that it was, but it's something that's up for a debate. It's not an empirically provable fact. Yes. So what do you make of the fact that apparently so few of us can tell the difference between fact and opinion? I'm not surprised anymore. And I would point out to start this that this is not just a question of media literacy. If you can't see from those two statements which one is fact and which one is opinion, your problem is not media literacy, it's simple literacy. Mm -hmm. So we should be really... What's the distinction? That you, you're not reading critically or intelligently at any time because it, it's quite obvious which one is which. Mm -hmm. I do 
I hate to do this, but I have to blame the media for this partially. I was at the Globe in the late 80s, too. Fox News had just started. For some reason, the editorial, the, the head of the editorial group, decided that people were getting their news from TV, and therefore the Globe needed more opinion and more different kinds of features. This was happening everywhere. Fox then comes on the scene for TV that is essentially all opinion. Mm -hmm. The kind, I was at an advertising conference years ago as the token ethics representative. <laughs> Every piece of advertising that won an award that year had some sort of major ethical breach, and a lot of them involved putting advertising into editorial content. We've been allowing those lines, which used to be very sharp, to blur and blur mm -hmm. and blur, till it's no wonder that people can't tell the difference. Editorials and things like that. Yes, 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 yes. exactly. Yeah, but they yeah, need yeah. the money, don't they? They need the money. They need the money. But but at some point, you also start to compromise who you are and why mm. people think you're important. And that's kind of what my point was with the with the with the article. I would agree with Suhan on 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 literacy and media literacy. Um, there's been big efforts in the last few years by various organizations to start to try to come at. Um, media literacy at the at the high school level, uh, student vote and some of those things have done that. Uh, Canadian Journalism Foundation has been involved in that. News organizations have been involved in that. But the challenge we face, I think, Steve, is, is this, is that we used to have all that editorial job done for us by news organizations. But now we, we consume news totally differently than we used to. We don't rely on the Toronto Star or the Globe and Mail or, or the Montreal Gazette or CBC. We see information from all over the place. And some of it we know uh, is an authoritative organization because we know about them. Some of it we don't. That doesn't mean that they're not good because there's a lot of new organizations popping up. But where, where um, Professionals used, where professionals used to do that editorial culling of fact from fiction yeah. and all things, we now have to be the editors ourselves. And, and young people are pretty good at that. Older people are not very good at it. And the survey research that's out there suggests that, in fact, in terms of passing around misinformation and disinformation, it's older people rather than younger people who are worse yeah. at it. And we, but we all have to learn how to do it because we have to be our own editors. Yep. And we're using news in a way that some people always used it, but more and more people are using it not to get information, but to get an emotional jolt. Right. It's what Chris was talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. I was involved when I was freelancing in a study for one of the television networks on what people got out of the nightly news. And what they got was a soporific. It was their routine. They chose it on the basis of which anchor they liked. Mm -hmm. They did not absorb the information. It was just the thing you did before going to bed. If you it's a comfortable pair of shoes, in a exactly. way. Exactly. If you watched Fox News before going to bed, it would not have that effect. People watch the news, read the mm -hmm. news to get angry. We become, it's much worse in the States. Remember, Sun TV failed here. Yeah. But we're becoming adrenaline junkies with the news, and that's not a good way to learn what's happening in the world or to make an informed decision about who you're going to vote for. But I wonder how much reporters and or columnists have to take the blame on this, Chris, in as much as... Many members of the public now believe that people who write what are supposed to be straight-ahead news articles are actually writing pieces that are laden with their opinions. They're just being kind of surreptitious about it. Yeah. And they don't make a distinction between the hard news copy and the columnist. Yeah. Fair? Yes, fair, but there's a reason for that, I think. And one of the reasons for that is um, I produced The National for a year and a bit, was program producer in the early 1990s. Mm -hmm. I had a pretty good idea when we produced the program every night that most of our audience knew nothing about most of the stories we were putting on the air. Today, and it's for, for television newscasts and for newspapers as well, you're trying to produce products for an audience that ranges from one group of people who know everything about the story and the other group of people who know nothing about the story. So on both an overall newspaper or program level and on an individual story level, how do you frame your story? That's tough. What do you assume your audience knows? What do you assume your audience doesn't know? Newspapers have, so that's right, people, more people get news from television than get it from yes, newspapers. Yes, yes, yes. So newspapers decided what we're going to do as more and more people, there's no point present, printing today's news tomorrow when most people are getting news today. So we need to do something different. So what they started to do was think, how can we cast stories forward? So that, so that someone who's reading a story isn't reading what they may have seen yesterday for the percentage of audience that did, but it's going to tell them what's going to happen next. An interesting and perhaps valuable thing to do, but that leads you away from saying what happened and starts to lead you more towards what you think is going to happen. And you're and, often and that's, wrong. And that's, and that's opinion-based. And that's, yeah. you're, you're on the road to opinion there, hmm. yeah.
And, 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 and TV is doing some of that too. Mm -hmm. And remember also, we're seeing more and more polarization in society and the black and white thinking. So if you're wrong once, that's it. You're out. That's the only explanation I can come up with for the polls that show that more and more people are turning away from evidence-based knowledge. They don't trust science. They don't trust clinical trials. They trust some lunatic, holistic healer on the internet instead. You wrote in your piece that we quoted from at the beginning that one of the reasons why only 9% of Canadians, imagine this, 9% say they are willing to pay for news online, maybe because the news they receive seems so foreign to how they perceive the world. What do you mean foreign? Foreign in, in, the, in, the, in the sense that, um, on one level in the sense that most people who see things don't automatically get outraged. Most, mm -hmm. people, uh, most people consider things. I mean, it comes back to the point of trying to sort out what's consequential and non-consequential. There's lots of reasons why it's only 9%, and it's been 9% for a long, for three or four years at least. One of the reasons it's 9% is because the public perceives that they can see it everywhere for free, so sure. why should yes. they pay anything? Um, but, but they also, the, the inverse of that, is that they don't see that what news organizations are putting out has enough value or enough relevance to their lives to actually want to pay for it. Well, one of the things that happened in the United States to make people want to pay for stuff is Trump. And when Trump came in, people thought, hmm, maybe we should support buying a subscription to the New York Times because we actually need to keep this guy in check. But be careful. Um, okay. Don't use the New York Times as your example. Yes. Why I say not is because the New York Times maybe has a potential audience of half a billion people around the world. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah. If you can find three, four, five, six million out of half a billion that want to pay, you may be able to do all right financially. The hmm. Ottawa Citizen, for instance, there aren't half a billion people around the world who want to read the Ottawa Citizen or something right. else. So, so uh, you know, New York Times, Washington Post get pointed out as examples of what works, but they're hmm. globalized media. Do you think it's possible, Sue Ann, to, to have a cultural change in the minds of citizens that if they want to have a thriving fourth estate that keeps a check on the government of the day, that they may actually have to pay something for that. It's going to be tremendously difficult because, as Chris said, they've been getting it for free. Mm -hmm. And when you've been getting something for free for a while, you feel that you're being cheated if you have to pay for it. Hmm. I would say, ugh, this is so awful, but I think it's true. I think the one thing that would turn people more towards serious news, news that attempts to be objective and maybe make them willing to pay for it, would be something catastrophic. Well, let's have a different alternative. Can yes, we? I wish yeah. I could come up with one. I really hmm. do. But so far, I have not been able to. Young people really think that news drops from heaven, unless they're actually journalism students or journalists. <laughs> and but not that all of them read newspapers <laughs> yes. either. And so why on earth would you pay for it? They think that everything turns up on the internet by magic. And as you've been pointing out all along, with this failure to distinguish between opinion and actual reporting, they think that people just sit and make it all up, as indeed mm. a lot of the fake news we've been seeing, that's exactly mm. how it originates, from some guy in, in Romania. But there's another challenge in that too, which is that, um, and the private media will say this, the public broadcaster is giving it away for free, so how can we compete against them? And, mm. and, the, and the challenge and the question there that we haven't seen answered is, the federal government, as the owner of the CBC, what role do they see for the public broadcaster in the in the in this new media environment? Because you know? and, and even if you look, some of the criticism of the CBC is that the CBC and, and made by the private um, media companies is the CBC has ventured a long way into opinion and into commentary, which used to be the preserve of of, of the mainstream media. So so there's a bunch of issues out there that that and and at the same time, the government has got a program out where it's going to supposedly give $600 million to keep media alive while mm -hmm. it's giving it away for free. You know, if only somebody would write a book about some of these topics. <laughs> Do you know anybody, Chris, who might be up to that? Could be next year. <laughs> and what might that book be entitled? It's called The End of the CBC with a question mark uh, that David Terrace and I are writing that will be published by U of T Press in January, we hope. But, but, it's, but it's a serious question about mm -hmm. the, media, uh, the media environment. And, uh, but on the other side, from the CBC's point of view, you can't expect them to be a radio and television broadcaster and not want to get into online media if that's where everybody's mm -hmm. going. And similarly, if you've got places like London, Ontario, or Kelowna, or Kitchener, Waterloo, who aren't being well served, then maybe they should go in and set up stations. But it, that inevitably also, at some level, compromises the ability of Steve Pakin as an entrepreneur to think he wants to start a media publication. No, 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 he's on a public broadcaster now. I know, no, <laughs> but I mean, the second Steve Pakin. But if, if you wanted to be an entrepreneur and want to start up something, 
You're competing potentially Actually, you know against what? the public broadcast? The only mission I have in life right now is to end this segment because we're out of time. <laughs> but thank you both for coming in tonight and sharing your views on it. Chris Waddell, Carleton University, Sue Ann Kelman, Ryerson School of Journalism. Great to have you both on TVO. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.